Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. All right, y'all, I could not be more excited for today's podcast interview. I have Julianne Thorne from Naturally Cats. If y'all don't already know, June in the U.S. is Adopt-A-Cat Month. So we're going to be talking about tips for adopting a cat. And later on in the interview, we're going to be giving some tips for those 2.0 pet parents as well. So definitely stick around. Let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about Julianne Thorne, and then we're going to bring her in. All right, Julianne is a cat mom, holistic cat therapist, intuitive author, Reiki master, and certified behaviorist. She founded Naturally Cats to provide holistic help for cats and their guardians. Using a combination of environment enrichment, healing, soul connection, behavior modification, and botanical remedies, she supports cats emotionally to reduce and remove problem behaviors. She helps to educate feline guardians so they can provide for their cat and watch them thrive rather than simply survive. She connects with the family through the perspective of their cat, and reconnecting the cat with their guardian is a key element of her work. She has recently co-authored the first book of its kind, The Aromatic Cat, which details how to use herbs, hydrosols, and essential oils safely with cats. Julianne believes that understanding the emotional state of a cat is key to supporting problem behaviors and that through using botanical remedies, the cat's wellness can be balanced, which in turn affects its behavior. Julianne uses a holistic approach when working with a cat, looking at all elements that affect it, such as, but not limited to, diet, nutrition, environment, resources, and family relationships. Her mission is giving cats a voice. So without any further ado, Let's get into the interview with Julianne Thorne from Naturally Cats. Well, welcome, Julianne. Thank you so much for being here. So I I wanted to have you on because June in the U.S. is Adopt a Cat Month. And I would really love to get your perspective now that everybody knows who you are, because I told them uh, at the beginning, as a cat behaviorist. And so, I mean, you you deal with the whole cat. Well, you deal with everything. You deal with the whole family. (laughs) um, Some tips on adopting cats, um, whether it's a first time cat owner or somebody who's bringing a new cat into the fold, maybe somebody who hasn't had a cat in a while, because, you know, somebody who may have had a cat 20 years ago, we actually know a lot more today than we did 20 years ago. So yeah. what, what What do you think about that? What do you think about adding cats I mean, it's positive, right? Like, of course, cats are always good. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely, Jessica. I think you're you're, you're totally right. So adopting a cat is a beautiful experience. So first of all, you're saving a life, essentially, because we don't have as many here in the UK, but I know in the US, you know, and I don't know, we do have some, but you have the the shelters or the rescue centres where the cats, if they're not rehomed, don't make it, you know? So essentially, if somebody is, are going to adopt a rescue cat you are literally saving a life and what also I found that when you adopt a cat you actually save yourself in in some way so you know your heart may grow a little bit more or you'll learn stuff about yourself but it's never just about the cat it's about the human as well and you know I all of my cats have been rescued in fact if I think about my family I'd say all of my family we've had rescues and you know from young ones to older ones they can give you so much they really really can and it's it's a gift it is a true gift to adopt a rescue pet so like you said I I love the fact that there's awareness like the whole month you know adopt a cat rescue a cat I think it's great and and it's it's really an opportunity to grow your family you know I firmly believe that cats are members of the family they're not just like family members they are family members you know we open our hearts and our homes to them and we all live together you know we do and you know cats haven't been living in our homes for that long like if we think about the history of humanity right just since 
the invention of cat litter, <laughs> really. Mm-hmm. Have cats yeah. been living inside uh, of the, our homes with us. But I know personally, I have not lived a day of my adult life without having at least one cat. And I am just, uh, you know, my cats are my teachers, my cats. I, I, I firmly believe that our, our pets are, they come into our lives for a reason. So many of them come into our lives to teach us something. And sometimes we actually are here to teach them things too. I have one cat in particular that I strongly feel he has taught me a lot, but (laughs) he has, he has worn my patience a little thin sometimes, Mm -hmm. but, um, I also believe I'm supposed to be helping him through this, this life as well. So yeah, our, our pets are just really, really incredible animals and our cats, especially, I think teach us, teach us patience, teach us, (laughs) teach us how to, how to, how to like, our cats are, first of all, cats are cats, right? Like those of us that treat our cats like children <laughs> for, I don't have any problems calling myself a pet parent. I don't have any problems saying that my pets are my babies. Um, whether you choose to not have your own children or whether you don't have children for other reasons, or even people who have had children and they've grown up and now they're moved out and now they're getting pets. And those they're, I don't have a problem with that. As long as we are treating our pets as cats are cats and dogs are dogs. Right. Um, and that is a huge learning experience for us Mm -hmm. as humans, I think. And I think it also gives us a lot of perspective to give other humans in our lives room to be themselves as well. So there's just so much learning to be had. Um, And I, I think cats, cats are especially good at this because they can push our buttons. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll I'll tell you, like, I've realized that Leo, my, who's as a grown up, my second cat, um, you know, he is teaching me patience. Like you said, I, I am terrible with that lesson and I experience it in a lot of different ways. But with him, he adapts to change very, very, very slowly. So as we know, most cats take a while to adapt to change. And a lot of cats don't particularly like change. But with Leo, there's like an extra layer, right? So he's teaching me patience. He's also teaching me surrender. So as a human, I like to think that I can do this and go there and make this list and have control over this. You know, like you said, we've we've artificially domesticated them. You know, we've brought these cats into our homes. And he is teaching me to surrender, to not care about the little details, to have faith and to to live in trust, you know, because like last year he didn't eat and it wasn't just overnight. It wasn't 24 hours. He ended up in hospital, you know, at the vets for four nights because he wasn't eating. And at one point I thought all the worrying in the world, I just can't, I can't help him. I give in, right. I am here for when, for whatever I can do for him. When the vets call me, I will be there. And in that moment, I remember I just surrendered and then, literally within 10 minutes I got a phone call from the vet saying he's literally just eaten and I was like how fascinating is that you know and and I, I agree with you you know we we can call them our babies we can call them whatever it is that we like but we do need to remember that they are cats and they have specific needs right they're, they're not small dogs and that is something that I think is really important so I know with your podcast you speak about cats and dogs and I love the fact that you speak about the individual species but we do need to remember that cats are not small dogs. You know, they have different requirements. They have different needs. And also, like, they can't be left alone for long periods of time. You know, cats may seem aloof and, you know, some of them anyway may seem like they're not really bothered. But the one thing that I've learned in 15 plus years of working with cats is that they do thrive on connection. They, they do need interaction. So leaving your cat at home, you know, with a bowl of food down for a couple of days isn't a good thing to do. You know, they will they will not react well to it. So when we think about rescuing a cat, one of the first things I would say people to people is what can you manage? You know, think about how how you can help this cat. How much capacity do you have for time and attention and interaction? You know, let alone the kind of practical stuff, you know, have you got the budget for it? Have you got the space for it? So, you know, even people that are limited with space and a budget, you can still, you know, like to use the word, but catify your home. You can still provide a litter tray. You can still provide access to look out of a window, a cat tree or a post, you know, and 
it, it's it's the kind of the logical things to think about in terms of resources but also like I said it's about what can you give you know what, what can you give to your cat and when we got our second cat Max you know it wasn't because I wanted a cuddly cat we, you know we got a second cat for many many reasons so whether you're bringing you know your rescue cat home as the first cat the second or maybe like the fourth you know fifth or whatever I know you've had was it 12 you said to me at one point that was the most I had yes <laughs> at one point uh, kudos to you my love I was I was amazed when you said that so regardless of whatever number cat you're bringing home you know have a think about what you can give to them because like you said they will all teach us different things and we will learn a lot from them but we have to give to them you know we have to provide for them with their resource but we have to provide emotionally you know we have to be able to connect to them and to understand their mental and emotional health because that's where we start to get problems if those if their needs aren't met emotionally and mentally that's when you'll start to see like problem behaviors like over grooming or you know urinating around the home and stuff so it's really important that before you kind of consider which rescue center you're going to go to have a think about you know you what can you provide what can you give to the cat I would say was the first thing to think about Yeah, I think that is a great tip. And just before we move any further, I do want to say having 12 cats at once taught me that that's too much, not because they did, they needed a home. They Mm -hmm. more than likely every last one of them had a much better life than they would have otherwise, Mm -hmm. um, just because of how I acquired them all. Mm -hmm. But just to say, so people out there understand for me, 12 was too much, way too much. Um, and depending on the season of life you're in, you can handle Mm -hmm. different things. And I was younger, I was in my twenties and everything was fine. I had tons of energy, (laughs) no (laughs) social life, (laughs) but, um, now today I have Mm -hmm. four and I still, I'm, I'm still at that point where I'm like, I feel like this is I can't, this is it. This is the most I can handle in this season of of my life. But yeah, yeah, just so people understand that (laughs) moving forward. But um, yeah, so assessing yourself is Mm. a really great first step, first tip. I I love that. If you, if you assess yourself and you think, okay, I do have plenty to give and I I have room, I, I have resources, I would love to have this cat. I understand that I can't leave them for long periods of time. Um, that's one of my biggest pet peeves, by the way, is that yeah. <laughs> leaving yeah, not a good idea for long periods of time. Yeah. But um, once you've decided, okay, I can do it. I'm going to, we're going to do it. We're going to get a cat. What should you do before bringing your cat home? What kind of tips do you have for preparing to bring a cat home? Yeah. Great question. So prep is the, you know, is definitely essential, definitely needed. So first thing I would say is to find a space in the home. So like you said, you know that you've got the budget to get extra cat food, you know, litter tray, scratch and post, etc. Great. It's the space. So ideally, I would always advise clients and, you know, my community and any cat lover to have an allocated space for when you bring that cat home. So cats, Uh, cats feel safe when they've got established territory and to have established territory they use something called scent markers so cats you know they've got scent glands on the side of their face and the bottom of their um, paws and basically whatever smells familiar to them that's what they will consider their territory so think about your cat is going from a rescue center you know a pen a cage or whatever to this new space now as much as a human we, we may think open up the house, give them the whole space to roam around, that can actually be quite intimidating for a cat. It can make them quite nervous and sometimes fearful, which could lead to aggression. So one of the best tips that you can do when you're prepping is to find a space. So we used our downstairs spare room. You know, when we brought Leo home, we had the whole house free, but we used a downstairs spare room. So find a space where you can keep the cat contained. So in that room, like you said, you know, you want a litter tray, you want a food bowl. They've got to be at opposite ends of the room. You know, you have a water bowl and that's not near the litter tray or the food bowl because cats won't drink from a water source next to a food source. 
So, you know, you've got your three corners, food, water and litter, and then like a scratching post or a cat tree in the middle uh, and a couple of toys. You know, that that's the kind of key setup. And you need to make sure that you can shut the door and that the room is secure. So ideally, it's about leaving the cat to decompress. So when they've transitioned from the rescue centre, car drive, journey, you know, bus, whatever, and come to the, their forever home, they need time. They need time to adjust because generally, regardless of how awesome the cattery or shelter is, the cat's going to be stressed to some degree. So you need to give them the space to decompress and to allow the kind of hormone levels in their body to reduce, allow their stress response to kind of dissipate and allow them to just, you know, adjust to the situation. So bring them when to, so get the, the space prepped and make sure you can shut them away, you know, make sure that they're safe. And if possible, if you've got chance to, if you know the cat you're getting and you've got chance to visit them a couple of times, ideally, I would suggest you take a bit of clothing. So something like a worn T-shirt. You know, if I'd had this on for the day, I was going to the cattery later this evening. I'd take this with me and leave it with them so that the cat could get used to my smell. So if you've got capacity to do that, to do a couple of exchanges with the cat in terms of pieces of fabric before you bring them back. Brilliant. Um, also ask the rescue center if there's any pieces of fabric that you can take home even if you wash them and return them so has the cat been sleeping in a certain type of bed at the rescue center can you borrow that because again anything that you can bring with the cat to the home which will enable it to smell something familiar will help to make it feel safe so like you said assess yourself and then get the space ready is really the next step making sure that you've got a secure space with all their resources where they can just settle down that would be the next thing I would say that's awesome and the the idea of them their scent being familiar Mm. to them and calming them I think that's something that a lot of people don't know or understand so I think that's going to be a really key key point and, and since swapping. So that's something else you can do, right? So yeah. if you have like a piece of fabric or even, um, what are the two crazy cat ladies use like a sock on their hand yeah. Yeah. You can rub on the cat's face as you're yeah. petting, petting them, yeah. and then use that to put their scent on other items, other objects. If you bought a brand new cat tree or scratching post, right? So that's, um, one way to help new items smell mm-hmm. familiar to your cat, which can, yeah. So that in that same idea, I think that's, um, that's awesome for people yeah. to, to understand. Cause I think a lot of people don't even know anything about yeah. swapping. <laughs> so, so, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, scent is key, you know, cats communicate in every single way through smell. So they will sniff their food. And if it smells slightly off, if there's any form of bacteria growing, we might not be able to see it or smell it. If they can smell the hint of it, they won't eat it. So when people say cats are fussy eaters, sometimes that's one of the reasons why the pouch has been open too long. The food's been down for too long. They can smell the bacteria in it. You know, they use their sense of smell to establish their boundaries, their territory inside the home, outside of the home. Um, you know, when they clean themselves, they're not just cleaning themselves to keep their coat clean. They're actually ingesting the scent that's on their fur. So when we stroke our cats, you may notice some cats do it. Leo, our cat, does it straight away. Um, as soon as you've stroked him, he'll clean. And, it, and it's not like to get rid of your scent. It's actually to ingest your scent so that he f- feels this sense of comfort and this security. So, you know, when they scratch things, they're using the scent pads on the bottom of their hands to scent mark, whether it's the sofa or a scratching post. And they will keep going back to the same place because the smell fades, the scent fades. So, you know, every home has something called a community scent. So your house will smell different to my house. Even if someone had two cats in the same space that I've got, it would smell different. And, you know, when you are bringing the cat home, it's really important because they will feel comforted and safe and secure by familiar smells. And like you said, when you're starting to let them out of the room, which I would say, you know, at least 48 hours later, you know, you give them chance to just in that space. Sometimes you might need to leave it a week or two. We left Leo in his space for a week and a half before we even opened the door. Um, he was particularly fer- uh, particularly nervous. Um, like you said, use the sock. I recommend that so many times, you know, an old pair of socks and you, like you said, on their scent glands all over their body and you do it door height. So, you know, wherever the, the, the room is that they're in, you use their scent to the next kind of door frame or the next bit of wall or whatever. And actually when you're introducing, you know, another cat to the home, it's a great tool, 
great, great tool because you get the existing cat is used to the new one and vice versa. So you have two socks and you go from one to the other and you use the sock on cat A and put it on, you know, let the uh, cat B sniff it. So scent, scent is crucial, is everything. And, and, you know, we can't smell it. So I think as humans, sometimes we forget about it. Like you said, or we may not even know about it. And, that, and that's okay. You know, we don't know everything. But if, you know, if people can take one takeaway from this podcast, from this recording, it's, you know, it's scent. It is really, really key. And it does, it, it's like multi multifaceted, you know, it helps them on so many levels. It's, it's, it's amazing. It really is amazing. <laughs> So if you bring a cat home and they're having a little bit of trouble adjusting, you've done everything you've talked about, giving them at least 48 hours to to hopefully decompress, but they're just really having a hard time adjusting. Maybe they're still hiding. They're not interacting. Um, Even at a week, um, you know, I certainly have had cats in the past do this. What kind of tips do you have for people to help for lack of a better word, those scaredy cats. <laughs> so you're right. It's generally fear, you know, and it and it, it can take some cats a while to adjust. Like I said, we didn't let Leah out for a while. And, you know, it's it's okay to have a nervous cat. So one thing I would say is, you know, again, it's, it starts with a human. Look at your expectations. You know, what are you expecting this cat to do? Because a lot of us that have cats want a cuddly cat because we like this the feel of their fur. We like to stroke them. We like to have cuddles. So if you've got a cat that you've brought home and it's not going well, they're not really interactive. They're like you said, hiding away. Maybe they're sort of eating sporadically or, or you know, Leo only ate overnight. He wouldn't eat anything through the day. He'd only eat when the house was pitch black and dead quiet. Um, so have a look at what you're expecting the cat to be like, you know, and, and don't panic because I've found that some people have returned cats to the cattery because the cat's not playful and it's not coming out of its shell. And what I would say to that is, you know, look at humans. So many of us are are, are not good in social situations or we take a while to kind of open up to others. You know, cats are exactly the same. So have a look at what you think the cat should be doing and take a step back. Look at what it is actually doing. So in the in that well, let's say use the time frame of a week you know have they eaten with you around you know have they actually come out of the carrier because even those what would seem like insignificant changes are big steps for some cats one of the the, the best tips that i give to people is if you've got a nervous cat don't put any pressure on them so by that i mean you know, we would sit in the room with Leo and we wouldn't try to pet him. We wouldn't try to stroke him. We wouldn't go anywhere near him. We would just sit in the room on the floor. We had a cushion. My husband was on his phone. I'd be reading a book. You know, we'd do it separately and we'd just be busy. We'd just be in the room and we'd be talking. So every now and again, we'd start talking to Leo. um, But it was never like going up to him or, or, or going into his space. It was just so he knew I'm here. We're here, you know, and, and, I never forget one day he jumped down from the windowsill because he was all bunched up and you know big eyed, petrified. He jumped down and he sniffed my foot and I was so desperate to stroke him or to reach out to him. I was like so desperate. And I thought, I can't because if I do, he's just going to bolt, you know, and he sniffed my foot and he rubbed it with the side of his face and then went back up to the windowsill. And I was like, yes, we made progress. So if you've got a nervous cat, just be patient. Like you said, right at the beginning, right? They are here to teach us, I think, above all, patience. So understand what they need. Do they need space? You know, do they need no one in the room for 24 hours just with bowls of food going down, litter tray cleaned? You know, do they need time by themselves? Or are they actually okay with you being in the room? Just be in the room and don't have any expectations from them. You know, just be present and be with them. And take it slow. So when you, if, for example, if you sit there reading, maybe the next time you have a toy and you, you know, you do it at a distance. So you're not right in front of the cat. Perhaps if you've got uh, got, um, a wand toy, you know, you're, you're kind of here, the cat may be over there and you can, you know, do the toy in front of them or near them. So it's, it's trying to find out their boundaries. Essentially, that's what's happening. So you're trying to understand what does the cat need and how can I provide it? Do they need space? Do they need distant interaction? Do they just need, you know, awareness that we're here? And it'll be different for every cat. So that unfortunately, there's no kind of one size fits all. 
but I can tell you that if you sit there and you just watch them and just chatter with them, you will figure it out. If they look to you or make moves to you, you'll know, you'll you'll start to notice how you can interact with them. So be patient is is the top tip. <laughs> yeah. And you said so many things that I want to like take little <laughs> tangents on. Um, so I'm going to try to get to all okay. of them. I, I have one cat. So all of my cats right now, I, I have four at the moment. And they are between 13 and 14, all of them. And I have been eight years old. Yeah. Yes. And I have with three of them I've had since they were little, little kittens, like they were probably six to eight weeks old. They were way too, like even too young, in my opinion, to be away from their mother. Yeah. And one of them, two of them are litter mates. One of them who is a litter mate, one of the litter mates, he when he was little, when he was a kitten, he was so fearful and I worked with him and I worked with him and I worked with him. And literally for the first year, almost the only physical interaction he would have with me is that when I would be sleeping at night, once I would fall asleep, he would come and sleep around my head. And when I would wake up in the morning, he was gone. He, that was his cue. He was gone. And, but it, it, it felt so good that it was like, okay, he does want to be near me. He's Mm -hmm. just unsure of how to do it when I'm active. Like this is too Mm -hmm. much for him. This is too much excitement for him. And to figure out ways to incorporate downtime in my life, right. Mm -hmm. So that he can participate in my life outside Mm -hmm. of sleeping. Mm -hmm. Um, That was something that I had to learn with him. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, he's, um, about 14, he will not use the litter box in front of me. It's just him, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and learning, Mm -hmm. learning our cats and letting them be themselves and supporting them in any way we can, I think is, is crucial and key. And one of the things you were talking about, so that was kind of an example I wanted. (laughs) to. Yeah, no, I completely, I completely agree with you. And and our Leo is the same. So when, for the first 12 months, we couldn't touch him. The only time that he would come anywhere near us on the bed was when the light, as soon as the light switched off, we switched off the light and you'd feel this lump come on the bed, you know, and and, and now he comes on my pillow, he comes on my pillow first thing in the morning, like literally I'm just waking up or he wakes yeah. me up and he sits there maybe five, 10 minutes when I'm kind of like out of that brain fog of the, you know, the morning, the night, night to morning transition, when I'm awake, he goes, you know, so it is it, very, very similar to you, you know, but that that's, that's who he is and what I do like I cherish those few moments as I'm sure you did when when the cat was on your head Mm -hmm. you know you may want more but actually what that in that moment is beautiful right just understanding that that they're giving you everything they can and for them in that moment that's that's all they can manage it's just it's lovely it is lovely I know it's it's making me like really emotional right now to think about it (laughs) (laughs) um because you know you have sometimes more challenging cases and while they're frustrating in the moment It's Mm -hmm. so rewarding every little breakthrough and you're, you're like, your expectations change and and what you see as progress changes and every little thing is just so, I don't know if you haven't experienced it, it's so hard to describe, but I know you've experienced it. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think our, our expectations is something that we really have to look at, you know, because cats aren't here to fulfill our needs, you know, as much as we think they are, whether we want a cuddly cat, a, um, um, a funny cat, a cat that's around all humans, a cat that we can stroke their tummy, whatever it may be. We have to understand that they are who they are, you know, so whether you get a cat from a rescue center or a shelter, which I would always highly, highly advocate whether you get a cat from a breeder, whether you get a kitten, a young cat, an elderly cat, doesn't matter. Every single cat is an individual and it's our our job as their guardians. I know you use the term pet parent, either way, guardian, pet parent. It's our job as their kind of protector to understand them. You know, Leo is completely different to Max and I'm sure with your four, your 12 and every cat you've probably come into contact with, they are all completely unique. So if someone said to me, I expect you to be like Jessica, or I expect you to act the same way or speak the same way or eat the same way, I'd be like, what earth are you talking about? You know, I'm, I'm who I am. And, and we need to recognize that about our cat. So, you know, if you are struggling or you're frustrated with your cat in whatever way, shape or form, they're pushing your button, they're testing your limits, they're pushing your boundaries. I would really encourage everybody to 
take a breath because that always helps to ground us and center us take a breath and look at why you are getting frustrated what is your cat trying to, to share with you what is it you can do for them you know because like you said that's the true magic when we have a cat rescue pedigree whatever they are trying to show us something we we you know we've got the we have the capacity to listen to pay attention we're not always present you know we're, we're on our phones we're doing emails we're working we're with the dog we're with the kids we're with the partner you know we're like 50 million things going on in our heads I, well, I know I am anyway <laughs> you know and it can take a lot it can be a really conscious choice to be present with them but cats are present they're so in the moment you know and I think I think it was Tony Robbins that said and I think so I think, I think it was Tony Robbins that said turn your ex- expectations into appreciation and your whole world changes and I have to say I have to consciously remind myself of that but it is true so when Leo is frustrating me because he just won't meet Max or he runs away and and Max isn't even in the house or you know we're we're going through introductions at the moment you know I'm like for goodness sake buddy you know he's not here nothing to be scared of but in that moment he is and actually what I have to appreciate is that he has come near the house he has let me pick him up to bring him in you know I have to and I have to appreciate him rather than expect things from him because that in my opinion is where the true beauty in a relationship with your cat can be when you see them for the unique sentient sensitive being that they are that's when your heart and your relationship can truly blossom I know, isn't it? They are just so, so incredibly wonderful. I know. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) One other thing that you brought up and I was hoping to get to it is the importance of play with our cats. Yes. And I think this is also something that cat parents, especially I say parents, it's just my thing, but guardians overlook almost more than anything else yeah. is playtime with their cats. So can you tell me about that? How important yeah, that, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point. So play, it has so many purposes. That's not potentially the, the, the right word. It has so many um, functions, you know, so first of all, like it helps your cat physically, you know, it helps them to not be a little chunky monkey and, and to keep their weight, you know, um, keep their weight down. But it then also supports the joints and their blood um, circulation, you know, but it, then it also helps their mental capacity. So their mental stimulation, their mental function, their mental health state. Um, so sort of like logically, it's really important to, to play with them, to have interactive time with them. For me, I'm all about the emotions. So, you know, it is a beautiful bonding exercise between you and your cat. And again, I think that's where we're missing it. And I, I'm, I'm guilty of that. You know, I play with baby Max because he's a lot younger. He's seven months old. He needs that. You know, he can't play with Leo. He doesn't have any access to any other cats. And I don't want him to start doing destructive behaviors, you know, on, on, on the home. So I play with him with a wand toy, with a fish, with a little mouse. We have all sorts. My, my house is littered with cat toys. Um, so, you know, I play with him. Whereas I was thinking the, the other day about Leo, when it's evening and we're just before I'm about to get in the bath. So there's like a five minute window when he comes out from under the blanket and it's like, oh, it's a real cat in my house. And we'll either have some healing if he, if he wants it from me or he has playtime. And it's like five minutes a day, right? And it's not even every day, but that's that's all he kind of can manage with me. But in those moments, I'm watching him, you know, and, and play. There's a difference between, you know, sat watching the telly and like just waving a toy. You know, that doesn't, your cat's not going to go for it. They're not going to pounce. They're not going to play. And I've actually, you know, I've seen cats that just look at their guardians and they're like, seriously that's that's what you're doing for me you know the the cat you get a look from the cat you know right you get a look from them and you're like okay when you're playing with them read their body language so cats are are hunters regardless of the out indoor outdoor debate nature and all the rest of it cats are hunters they're carnivores so they are wired you know through um their nature to pounce to hunt to to find prey so 
if you've got a cat and you've got a for example like a wand toy which is you know you, you you've got a handle you've got a long wand and on the on the end you've got a bit of string or or elastic and then you've got something on the end like a worm a wiggly worm or like a, a feather or something that's a wand toy in case people don't know what we're talking about um and again you know getting the toy and just kind of like wiggle it in the cat's face that's not going to instigate any you know any mental stimulation is not going to uh, alight any physical drive for the cat to play with it so become the mouse is what I say to people become the mouse you know think about um little birds or, or mice you know have the toy and kind of flutter it around you know and then drop it and then hold it for a second and then do it again and you know if you're pretending to be the mouse what do they do they scurry and then they hide behind something and then they scurry again and then they hide and the cat sniffing and looking out and waiting for the for it to scurry again so it can then pounce on it that's the kind of behavior that you want to try to mimic with toys it's you need to be the prey you know you can't just dangle it in front of their face or poke them with the toy and expect them to be interactive engaged or bothered to to do it you know but it is such a beautiful um connection and, and actually what I found pretty much every time I end up laughing you know I mean they're laughing at me with the crazy stuff I'm doing with a toy or I'm laughing at Max or sometimes Leo you know occasionally Leo jumps really high and I'm like oh good job but that's amazing you know and it, and it, it like it astonishes me to see him being playful and getting engaged with it you know I laugh so my energy is lighter you know we're really bonded and present with each other and like I said that's where cats live in the present moment so play is crucial you know physically and mentally it's really really key because if a cat doesn't burn off their energy they don't have mental stimulation you're going to get things like over grooming. You're going to get destructive behaviors that don't need to be happening. You know, if your cat's chewing at your skirting board or it's constantly, you know, it's like not just clawing at your sofa, but, you know, destructively kind of shredding your sofa. Generally, cats are frustrated. And I think play is something that is such a simple way to engage with them, to connect with them, that will actually reduce and remove, you know, a lot of issues when it comes to cats and their, their behavior patterns. Um, and it's so straightforward, you know, you don't have to do 45 minutes every day, you can do five, 10 minutes a day that, you know, that in itself will be enough because it will, it will just make such a big difference. It is. And, and so as a, a dog trainer, that's one of the points that I try to get across to people so much is that bonding that you do with your dog, both in play and walking. And also you were previously talking about you know, your cat being fresh or you being frustrated really is what you were talking about with our cats. And that's also one of the things that I talk to people about, um, when I'm showing them, you know, helping them train their dogs is that I only like to train in depending on the dog, you know, maybe 10 minutes, yes. pushing it at 15 minutes at a time, yes. because your dog is going to get bored. Your dog is like, if you have become frustrated in training with your dog, guaranteed your dog has already been frustrated for like a while now. Yeah. So it is a like stop, you know, yeah. if you can end on a positive note, any way yes. you can, you, you know, do yeah. something simple um, so that you can reward and end on a positive note. And I mm -hmm. think the same is true with our cat. I, I mean, obviously, as you said at the beginning, our cats are not small dogs by any means, but I feel like a lot of the principles that we have been learning with our dogs over the past, you know, 20, 30 years where we've been getting positive reinforcement <laughs> training with our dogs, um, really applies to our cats as well. In fact, one of my cats, um, I have been using, like, I've never trained my cats. Like I don't mm -hmm. teach them tricks or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, I don't, not that I think it's bad. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, I think it's a, a good way to bond with your cat. Once you've established, mm -hmm. you know, they've been established in your home. I think it's a good way to bond with them, but I've been using some positive reinforcement techniques with one of my cats because he was spraying for a number of years mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we have finally got to the point. I, I tried everything. Like I tried everything mm -hmm. when I'm from, from, I started out with traditional veterinary medicine, which was definitely not the way to go, but I tried it. Cause that's where I started. 
yeah. all the way into the woo woo, right? Like I yeah. was like, <laughs> And it wasn't until I started rewarding him for what I wanted him to do, which was going in the litter box. That's when it all changed. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah, with just with that point about frustration, if you're frustrated, your dog or your cat, I guarantee you has been frustrated in some form or fashion. (laughs) Um, Stop, stop what you're doing. If you can end on a positive note, end on a positive note. And resume at some other time. Yeah. It it doesn't have to be, you know, with play particularly, like like you said, or or with behavior modification, if that's what you're doing. You know, some cats need constant mental stimulation. You know, for example, like Bengals, you know, they're very active, very physical breed. Um, but some cats, you know, need a lot of stimulation. They need a lot of so they are great for training. You know, we had to train Leo to have because he's asthmatic to have an inhaler over his face and again it took us six months like I said to the beginning he adapts to change very very slowly so we were just doing a, a tiny little bit at a time but as you said Jessica you know positive reinforcement will win every single time shouting screaming got you know god forbid if anybody hits their cats you know squirting water bottles whatever it may be negative reinforcement will not work it will only damage your relationship with your cat it may you may not see it straight away but it will they will start to fear you or or objects or whatever positive reinforcement is is the way forward and and again that works for everyone because look at humans you know if you're trying to learn to swim and your swimming instructor's like come on you can do it you know half a meter more you're almost there you're like yeah i can do it i'm absolutely knackered but i can do it Whereas if he's like, well, you've got half a meter left, you know, what are you doing? You're not doing very well. Come on, go faster. You're like, well, I don't want to try anymore, you know? Um, so with cats and, and play, their their energy levels also, it's short bursts. You know, if you think about if they were completely wild or feral, they don't hunt all day long because that's essentially what play is. It's a domesticated version of hunting. So cats will probably in general in the wild eat you know two to four meals essentially so two to four mice small birds rodents whatever um so they're not hunting they're not playing all day long you know they they only do it for a short amount of time and actually like if they're um if they've been doing it for say 10 15 minutes sometimes you'll notice that cats will actually stop the activity go and rest and sleep because they need to recharge because their bodies are not meant like for humans to be on the go all the time because the you know the hormones the energy the body sort of systems they all kind of gear up to to do it that activity that's not sustainable so you mentioned about ending on a positive note Absolutely. And with play, there is one key tip as well to do with cats. So whether you're using a wand toy, you know, a little fish or a laser pen, a lot of controversy about laser pens, um, regardless of the toy that you're using, make sure that your cat can catch the prey. So it's no good, you know, having your cat running around and running around and, you know, up the walls and, and, and getting them to do this exercise if at the end of it, there's no, what I would term as reward, but there's no animal, there's no kill because that will lead to mental frustration because that's like us getting super excited about something. And then it just not happening. You're like, well, I'm kind of left high and dry here, you know, and all the body, all the chemicals in your body have nowhere to go. So it's important to make sure you've got, I don't know, like a soft toy or something called like a kickaroo type toy, like a cushion type thing. Um, uh, or a treat, you know, or a bit of God, whatever you feed, you know, if you feed like raw food and you want to give them like a dead chick or whatever, whatever it may be, but give them something at the end because they need to like do that complete cycle. So mm-hmm. they need to, you know, pretend or pluck the fur, the feathers. They need to use their back feet to kick at it to make sure it's dead. They need to use their teeth and, you know, the movements with their with their body to actually kind of kill the prey. So regardless of the tool you're using, make sure at the end you give your cat something to finish that, that, um, that cycle of behavior. And if, it, you know, if you don't have something that they can kind of play with, give them a treat, you know, like you said, ending on a positive note. Um, and even if your cat's not necessarily food driven, cause not all of them are, it will still work well. It's still that whole, um, action and reward, you know, behavior and, and reward. And, and it's just so simple, but it is really, really effective. 
Well, I think that's a pretty darn good crash course in what you should be paying attention to, what you should be thinking about when adopting a cat. I would like to add, if you don't mind, for Mm -hmm. those, as Rodney Habib likes to call them, 2.0 pet parents out there (laughs) who are (laughs) gung-ho for getting their cat, they're all ready, they're prepped. What are some of the 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 2.0 <laughs> things to think about when bringing a cat home like diet possibly and we don't have to go into huge detail but just to give people like something to chew on something to think about to put little a little spark in their mind to say okay once we get settled i need to start thinking about xyz what are some of yeah. those like 2.0 tips Okay, so I would say first thing that you did is nutrition. So always feed what they're eating at the Cattery or Rescue Centre. Don't make any changes when you bring them home. But look at what you do on a feed. So cats are carnivores. You know, they survive usually, well, they thrive on a raw food diet. If you're not comfortable feeding raw, as many people aren't, the highest quality wet food you can that you can afford. Um, Sorry. And the Thank dog agrees. She, she agrees. She, she loves her raw food. <laughs> I <laughs> always get them. <laughs> so that's a that's a big thumbs up or pause up for raw food um you know you can make your own or you can get commercial um if you're not comfortable feeding raw then the highest quality wet cats do not thrive on a dry food diet it is it is manufactured it is man-made and it's ultra processed you know we'll do maybe another podcast on food another day but um you know definitely look at nutrition And I would say look at holistic cat care. So, you know, you need to make sure you've got physical, mental, emotional and spiritual needs covered. So physical, make sure you're registered with a vet. You know, if you're not if you don't have any near you, ask recommendations from friends and family. You always want to have somewhere that you can go for a physical checkup if needed. Um, Mental, look at what's around the home, look at what extra you can do where else can you catify you know what can you bring in extra beds or extra hidey holes or access to outdoors you know think about what more you can do catios that kind of thing um emotional i would say carve out time you know look at where you can set aside time to bond to brush to meditate with to really enjoy your cat and to to have that connection and then spiritual for me as you always you called it woo woo you know for me that's around looking at complimentary complimentary treatments so you know i use herb gardens with my cats you know you can use essential oils again whole other topic um you know you could use reiki or healing you know flower remedies the acupuncture there's a whole world out there of complementary treatments and modalities so look at what else you can do you know look at your cat and see what you want to learn and and see how you want to grow together would be the best bit of advice I would give I'm I'm so glad you mentioned herb gardens and essential oils first of all in the background there you've got your book which yes talk about both in the in the book correct yes we talk about herbs hydrosols and essential oils yeah yeah yes so I and I know since you're in the UK I don't know that you have access to them here in the US I am absolutely madly in love with animalio which is um that are veterinary grade essential oils that Dr. Melissa Shelton creates. So I, I don't know that you have any experience with them because I don't know if we can get them over there, but <laughs> no, no, I, I know I've heard her brand for sure, but, I, but it's not somewhere that um, I don't think we can get hold of them. Um, and again, you know, it's a whole other topic with essential oils, you know, I, yeah. I would always recommend not to use blends because you don't know which particular remedy the cat needs. They can tell you what they need, you know, self-selection. It's it's a really, really powerful tool um, to support their kind of health and well-being. But, you know, when you're looking at oils, you make sure, like you said, high quality. They need to be, you know, very, very good quality because there are a lot of adulterated options out there, which is just, it's not good. But like I said, you know, remedies is a whole other topic. <laughs> oh, yes, people. for sure. And the, the um, self-selection with the herb garden, which is something that people can access from you, correct? That that self-selection with the herb garden can be, um, I mean, that, first of all, it's just cool to see. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) But can help your cat so much as well, because plants have met it. I mean, you know, and, and there's, this is a whole other, other topic. I've recently been learning about 
especially with glyphosate and, and how the medicinal properties of plants are, are being, you know, removed through year after year after year using all these horrible chemicals, but still there's (laughs) innate medical properties in, in plants. And, and that's kind of the idea of the herb garden, right? Absolutely. And and like you said, you know, man is doing terrible things to the planet, right? You know, it is heartbreaking, but essentially, you know, cats, we, we have domesticated them, you know, we have artificially brought them inside, they've not evolved to come and live with us. So it's important to bring in the outdoors where you can, even if you've got an outdoor an indoor outdoor cat. So with the herb garden, it's it's brilliant, it's really straightforward and simple as well. So you put down a towel or a, a blanket, you know, a, a mat or something in a nice quiet space of the homes, we've got ours in our dining room, which we don't really use. And basically you put down a really good pinch of a dried herb or flower and you put one in each corner and that's it. So generally, you know, you'll see cats, they will rub and roll around. They might play with it. Some might just sit near it or next to it. You know, Leo is very, very reserved with it. And I only know he's used it because it's been a little bit disheveled. When I see it in the morning, he won't use it when we were around. Whereas Max the other day had it all upside down, was completely covered in all the herbs, which went everywhere. Um, but basically, you know, it's bringing the healing properties of these plants to our cats. So, for example, like rose, you know, tiny little rosebuds, organic, um, so they're not covered in pesticides and things. You know, they are rose is the most nurturing remedy in nature. You know, it is the like the flower of love, you know, so it's really emotionally supportive. We all know that a lot of cats will enjoy catnip take it out of the toy don't give them the toy they can access the the goodness that they need so with self-selection they may ingest it they may lick it they may rub and roll around on it but you can give that to your cat as the as the dried flowers the dried herb you know and like valerian root smells like sweaty feet it is the it is the most god-awful smell to me um but cats absolutely adore it and actually valerian root is really calming so any anxious or aggressive cats valerian root is fabulous for them so like you said, with herbs, it's the opportunity to let your cat have emotional support and mental support. So if you know they're fearful, if they're anxious, if they're nervous, having a herb garden down that they can just go to as and when they want to, it's another tool to support their well-being. And it's really simple and straightforward. Anyone can do it. And, and what's the worst that can happen? You put it down and your cat doesn't use it. You know, that that's the worst that can happen, really. So, so yes, I sell, I've got 10 gardens that I sell on my shop, um, on my website, which is www.naturallycats.co.uk. Um, on the shop tab, you'll see my 10 gardens. So I've put together herbs already. So we've got like one for pain, one for digestion, one for anxiety, one for aggression, and a couple of others. And it's really about saying to people, look, here's the kit. You know, you get a, a lovely sleeve with the individual bags of herbs in, I don't provide the mats so you've got to find your own towel or blanket to put down but you know and we do ship to the US so you can just you know grab a kit and give it a go and and I I have yet to find I think I've probably had about two two people email me out of I don't know oh god like thousands eight eight nine hundred that have said to me my cat's not done anything with it you know and I've said to them well are you sure because just because it doesn't look like it's all mixed up and thrown upside down doesn't mm-hmm. mean they've not used it. You know, cats are so sensitive. And like we said about their sense of smell, sometimes they just need to walk past it. Sometimes they'll just pause by it. And the smell that they get, the scent that they get will have that healing on their body, on their brain, their emotional system, their limbic system. You know, it, I could talk about self-selection for hours <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm really conscious that I'm talking quickly because I'm trying to get in as much information as possible. So let me take it back a notch so yes the aromatic cat book you can get that from my site it's a signed copy and it details all about herbs all about the herbs in my gardens the gardens you can get from my site and they are a great tool so they provide environment enrichment but they also provide mental uh, emotional and physical support so you know using those as a complementary treatment it's it's a great place to start if people are interested in doing more you know for their furry friends yeah. And, you know, I, I like to tell people, so it's kind of one of the, the rules of, of educating, marketing, all the things like talk to people like their children. Right. So I like not, not in a, in a mean or rude way, but just to get the point across so that people, everybody understands. If you think about you, like as a human, 
and the things that make you feel good. Like yesterday, so I've recently gotten into plants. So I've been like adding a bunch of plants around my home mm-hmm. and I bought a, a lavender plant that is in a room where my cats are not. Um, but <laughs> I bought a lavender plant yesterday. I repotted it and I put it in the kitchen and I literally walked by it and could smell. And it just like my whole body relaxed, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Just with the smell of me walking by it, I didn't have to go up to it and grab it and like yeah. put it up in my nose or rub it on my fingers. I literally yeah. just walked by it. And that kind of to me, like kind of hits home that point that are you sure your cat's not using it? Maybe Mm -hmm. your cat isn't, maybe your cat isn't using it in a way that you would expect them to, but go back to expectations, right? Why are, what are these expectations we're putting on our cats? Maybe they are getting use out of it, Mm -hmm. just not in a way that you were expecting them to. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And and to be honest, lavender, you know, you mentioned about when your cats are not, I assume that means because you think that it's bad for them or not good for them. So no, I think that lavender can be wonderful for our cats. I just don't, didn't want my cats chewing on, on the lavender plant because I just got it from the local shop. I don't know how it was grown or what was on. So yeah, I would prefer to buy, you know, very like a veterinary grade essential oil or, or something that was, I know was grown organically and, and dried for them than to let them get into a plant that I see. I'm not sure how it was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I was going to say, cause you know, lavender it's in my general garden. It's brilliant. I mean, like you, like you said, all my, all my herbs are all organic. Um, but you know, you may find like one of your cats will start to sit on the windowsill, you know, or wherever it is that you've got it just to get the smell of it. You know, plants can be so healing and, like I said, Leo's uh, got access to outside, but we still have a herb garden down for him because there are times when he's in and he still may need the help and support. So like you said, you know, they are, they're wonderful. And it's a really simple, really simple way to help them heal. You know, who doesn't want that? <laughs> right. I know. And an ounce, what is it? What is it? An ounce of present prevention is worth a pound of cure. <laughs> like the, the great. Yeah. Yeah. The more we can do to help them, be vital and thrive yeah. in life, you know, the, the less, the, hopefully the less we have to do, um, with, with, as they age with, you know, trying to, trying to fix all the things. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. For sure. Um, but yeah, I think, so you've given people some really, really great tips, whether they're just starting out or they are, thank you very much for all the, the 2.0, um, pet parents out there. I think those are some really wonderful tips. And I mean, if you're on the fence, if you are just not sure if you can handle it, I mean, I, maybe you can find some support through a roommate or a family member who can help you because yeah, I, I feel like I personally feel like my cats and and I didn't start out this way, but just over the many years that I've had pets, I feel like cats are more difficult than dogs. And most people think it's the other way around, but I, I truly do. I feel like they're shocking, but I don't, but not, I don't want to say that it's in a bad way. I just think that we don't like as a society, especially here in the U S we don't, we don't put our cats first. If that makes sense. Like Mm -hmm. we have a, a culture here where our dogs are everything. Mm-hmm. And cats are kind of, they kind of get the leftovers, you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And so when we really put everything into being the best cat mom, cat parent we can be and learning about our cats, there's just so much that we didn't know. We didn't know, <laughs> yeah. but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have that. Like, I, I truly, truly believe that. Mm we are supposed to like if a cat finds their way to you there's a reason for it (laughs) yeah and and like you said if people are on the fence I would say go back to the very first thing that we said you know why why do you want to get a cat and it it really comes back to that because you can't predict how a cat's going to be you can't make a cat do something you know you could do obviously there'd be consequences but um 
you know, you can't go to the shelter or the rescue center and tell them, I want this type of cat. I want a cuddly cat. You know, I want a confident cat. Because a lot of times you, when they're in that rescue situation, they're not going to be showing the, their true selves. You know, when we're panicked and we're fearful, we don't show up like our true selves. So, you know, have a think about why you want to get a cat. If you're on the fence, why why do you want one? You know, and what can you give it? Not what do you need from them? You know, it's about what can you give them? Because if you want it for cuddles, I would say practice self-love. You know, if you want it because you're lonely, I would say make steps to make connections first with, with other humans or other ways and then look to get a cat. You know, you can't get a cat to fulfill a need. You need to understand what you can give to them. And then whatever you whatever comes from that, if you get one, it will complement and it will grow together. You know, so, you know, if people are on the fence take a deep breath and and sort of listen to your heart, listen to your intuition and, and see what it's telling you about getting another cat. And ultimately you'll know if it feels right, you know, bottom line, if you turn your head off and you get out of the logic and you get out of the, oh, but I can't do this and will this work? And is this right? Stop all the noise, you know, and come into your heart space. That will tell you if it's the right thing to do. And like you said, nine times out of 10 with most people, a cat will show up somehow. If you if you think, you know, I want to get a cat, you'll find someone will message you within a week on your Facebook or your friend will tell you I've, my neighbor's got this cat or the universe works in, in beautiful ways to bring to you what you need. Um, and when you get them, enjoy. I know. And oh I think a lot of what you just said in my mind are reasons to look at adopting older cats as well. Mm. Um, I follow a bunch of different cat accounts on Instagram and a bunch of them that are like foster homes and most of them get like mama cats to where like they, they get a cat that's pregnant, let the cat, you know, have, have the babies, raise the babies up to, you know, around eight weeks they're, they're adopted. And then they, they adopt out the mom cat and they all say the same thing that the prize of every litter is that mom cat. And I personally have only gotten kittens because they came to me. <laughs> um, I, I used to do TNR, which is trap neuter, uh, return. And, um, we just had so many, so many cats in the neighborhood I used to live in, um, community cats, feral cats, depending on, you know, their level of socialization is, I guess what you call them. And a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of kittens came my way, which is how I got most of my cats. But before then I intentionally would go to the shelters and I adopted older cats, yeah. um, generally at least two years old. And it was, I, they were some of the best, like all of my cats are incredible. Don't get me wrong, but they had, they were just some of the best cats, like looking back. And even my husband will say, looking back, like he it's easier for him to be like, that was my favorite. I can't pick a favorite, but like he's, his favorites have always been the ones that I adopted when they were older. And I don't know if that's because of everything they had been through in their life already before coming to me, or I, I don't know, but, but that's another re like you, you kind of, somebody in that rescue center is going to have more knowledge of how that cat truly is and truly you know, when they're going to be, when, once they settle in your home, how their personality really is going to play out than a kitten. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that to me is another great, like, think about the older cats because they can really be some incredible, incredible pets. Yeah. That, there's, there's pros and cons for all ages, right? There, there really <laughs> is. I mean, bottom line is get a rescue cat, you know, <laughs> your, your heart will be filled with joy. Your life will never be the same again. And, you know, your your capacity for growth and, you know, connection is just it's unfathomable, you know. So it, adopting a cat is just one of the most rewarding, life changing experiences that anybody can ever do. So, you know, after you've listened to this, peeps you know, look at your local rescue center, you know, get in touch with Jessica or myself, you know, but do something and see if you can help, you know, because you will change a cat's life. Absolutely. And every cat, again, is an individual, is different. And so even if you've had a cat before, they're all different and they are going to change your lives, your, your life in a different way. I can promise you that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, Julianne, thank you so, so much for being here. I think we've got a ton of tips for people. And, um, I really do hope people take the opportunity to 
head out to your local shelter, contact your local rescue group, um, find, find that cat that is going to be right for you because yeah. I, that cat needs you. I promise yeah. you that cat needs you. Where can people find you? So, yeah, so I'm based in the UK and uh, so my website is www.naturallycats.co.uk. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Both of those are just at Naturally Cats. I'm also on YouTube. So I do a lot of um, classes, you know, webinars and workshops and things. A lot of that is on YouTube. You know, we store all our all of our, um, uh, our recorded stuff there. There's a blog on my page as well. And on my website, you'll find um, my shop. So that's where you can get the signed copy of the book and herb gardens you can see all my services so I offer like you know cat chakra cleanses and help with herbs so people need support with you know what to what herbs to give their cat um and healing and a cat communication session so I, I've got a such a raft of tools to help people so basically you know if you're stuck with your cat and you need help reach out feel free to drop me an email um or get in touch on social media and thank you Jessica I mean I must say I know we've been talking for so long and, and I could just talk about cats all day long. So if you try and alternate or you do like two dogs and one cat, if you want to have me back again, I would love to come back because this has just oh, been so lovely. And thank you for having thank me. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and everything you do, because again, I think cats are so underserved, um, especially, you know, in comparison to our dogs. So I appreciate Indeed. everything you do and please go to naturallycats.co.uk grab yourself some herb gardens, grab a copy of Julianne's book. You're going to get a signed copy if you get it through her, which is pretty darn cool. And um, yeah. Oh, and didn't, didn't I just see you have a collab with dogs first? Yes. Dr. Connor Brady. Oh yes. 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 <laughs> amazing man. Amazing man. We have connected and uh, <laughs> I'm the cat lady to his dog man um, or whichever way you want to say it. So, yeah, basically you will start to see a lot more from the two of us. So um, he's going to share some articles. That I'm going to you know, I'm writing for him. You can get a consult with me through his site. Eventually, in a few months down the line, you'll be able to do kind of the flip from you know my side to dogs. But basically, we're trying to help as many people as we can. So you know, our, our mission, my mission is to give cats a voice. And part of that is to educate and support, you know, and help people understand cats. And he's exactly the same for dogs. So we're trying to support either, each other. We're trying to support, you know, the other species. So people that have dogs work with him, know of him. They may have a cat in the background that they need help with, you know. So it's really about trying to work together to reach as many people as possible. So you'll see me starting to pop up on on uh, his social media. We're going to do a couple of lives and things like that. And again, vice versa. So yeah, it's going to be great. And I'm, I'm really excited to see how we can help people to just, you know, to learn about their animals, really. That's, that's the bottom line. It's great. Perfect. No, that's wonderful because like you said, I, I feel like so many people start with their dogs and then they're like, oh yeah, I could do this for yeah. my cat. Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I think that's perfect. So definitely um, check out Naturally Cats on Facebook, on Instagram, naturallycats.co.uk. Get your herb gardens for your cats and a, co a signed copy of Julianne's book. Thank you so much for being here. I really, I, I appreciate you so much and I enjoyed having you. Um, yeah, for everybody out there listening, y'all have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Make sure to give your pets some extra love from me and from Julianne today. Do you Absolutely. have any parting words you want to say goodbye? <laughs> So, so thank you very much for having me. And like I said, anyone, anyone's got any questions or concerns, you know, feel free to reach out. And just remember, if you are on the fence about getting a cat, trust your intuition, you know, put out there to the universe. If you'd like some help to find an answer, it will show you. And if you've got one, you've got a cat that's coming home to you, you know, expectations into appreciation every time, you know, look at what they're doing. Be grateful for the being that they, that they are and your relationship will really, really blossom. So go and have fun and, and get and, you know, enjoy your cats. And thank you ever so much, Jessica. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Me, me too. All right, guys. Bye. Talk to you next week. Oh, oh, oh.